Okay. My goal tonight is to present um, kind of a discussion about when back pain really is more than back pain. I think all of us know that back pain is all too common. Um, and as we'll see throughout the course of the talk, it accounts for the majority of disability um, in adults. But most of the time, the, ma the majority, the really the vast majority of back pain is self-limited. And kind of just to allay people's concerns, gives people some education, I thought it might be useful to talk about when is it more than just back pain? When, when might I need to see care? What can I do if it becomes a problem? And that's kind of the goal of tonight's talk. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly introduce the topic, go through some specific definitions of, you know, some maybe some terminology, some jargon, just to familiarize everyone with some of these conditions. I think probably one of the most important things of the talk will be discussing red flag signs. When, when is something maybe more of a problem um, than one might think? I wanna briefly go through some imaging, both when to get imaging and kind of help people in a very general sense understand what they're looking at. And then briefly, briefly, briefly touch on some treatment options. Um, maybe we'll have a little surprise in here also. Okay, so, so to start, so tonight's talk is about back pain. And before discussing, we need to just discuss when we're talking about back pain, what really are we referring to? And in a very, very specific sense, we're talking about pain, musculoskeletal, muscular pain, that goes basically from the bottom of the ribs to the top of the buttocks. We're not necessarily referring when we say back pain to pain in the groin or pain you know, in your chest or pain in the shoulders. We're really sp talking about a very specific location. And I think probably most importantly, when you present with back pain, that's not really a diagnosis. You know, If you go to a doctor and tells them, well, you have back pain, that's kind of not satisfying as a patient to hear that. We know it's a condition and our jobs as clinicians are to be able to kind of accurately define, diagnose the source of back pain in order to better treat it. I kind of think of it like a cardiologist. Chest pain is not really a diagnosis. You need to have an idea of, well, why are you having that chest pain? Because right? if we want any reasonable expectation of appropriate management, we need something more specific than just back pain. And we know it's a really big problem. So seven to nine out of every 10 people in the world are going to have an episode of back pain, most of which will actually cause them to present to a doctor, not necessarily a specialist, but even your primary care doctor. And on an annual basis, you're talking about one or two out of 10. So this is a real big problem. And at any point in a year, you're talking about you know three out of 10. So you look to your right, you look to your left, chances are one of those two people are having a back issue right now. And it's the primary cause of disability in people under 50 years old. So it's a, it's a common problem and it's a problematic problem because it influences uh, quite a bit. And so this is kind of what I'm talking about. When I say back pain, now again, we're talking about back dominant back pain. There are many sources. And so the source can be discogenic, which is the disc here, right? That could be a source of pain. You can have pain related to the joints in the back. So the same way you have joints in your fingers, joints in your hands, joints in your feet, joints in your kind of hip. There are joints in the back of the spine. Those joints are called zygoapophyseal joints, the facet joints, and that can be a pain generator. The nerves themselves can cause pain. In some cases, a very severe spinal stenosis themselves can cause back pain. And then there are other things like sacroiliac pain, lumbofascial pain, meaning muscular pain, fascial pain. And really my job, any really spine specialist job is to be able to diagnose more precisely the source of your pain in an effort to give you a better treatment plan. All right, so that's axial back pain. When do I need to be concerned about my back pain? And I think no discussion would be complete without talking about the importance of leg pain in that setting. I'm sure many of you have maybe gone to your doctor and said, hey, I'm a bad. The first question is, well, are you having any leg pain? And the reason we care so much about leg pain is because what leg pain represents to a high degree of sensitivity and specificity is that there's probably something neural going on. There may be some compression, you know, quote, a pinched nerve. And that can become a problem because that can later on lead to potentially severe pain, weakness, dysfunction. The good thing is the absence of leg pain, I'm calling it here sciatica. Sciatica really means it's a colloquial way to refer to leg pain. The sciatic nerve is a confluence of nerves coming out of the back. It's called the sciatic nerve. It goes down the back of the leg. That's the classic diagnosis. That's the classic um, example of leg pain, but you can have leg pain in the front of the leg or the side of the leg. That would all be um, leg pain of the same 
um, etiology, the absence of that pain is pretty strong evidence that you probably don't have a disc herniation. Now, of course, you can have a disc herniation in the absence of leg pain, but a significant one, you're probably going to have some component of leg pain. The other type of leg pain that we see frequently is the kind of both leg pain, that kind of pain that when you're walking, you feel a cramping, a heaviness, a numbness and tingling. That's usually worsened with walking and is relieved either by sitting down or leaning forward. That's referred to as neurogenic claudication. And kind of people with spinal stenosis, as opposed to maybe a disc herniation, that's the type of leg pain that they present with. Some people don't even call it pain. They describe it as kind of crampiness. You know, this just this strange sensibility in their legs. When you see people walking around hunched over in the supermarkets, pushing on the shopping carts, that's what we refer to as the shopping cart sign. That's kind of the hallmark of spinal stenosis. Perhaps more problematic are the red flags. A red flag, right, it alerts the clinician, maybe it alerts the patient themselves, that maybe this is more than just back pain. And so some of these things are very rare. This is not meant to scare anybody. I highlighted two things because these aren't really red flags, but they are kind of how we think as both spine surgeons and spine clinicians about problems. Many people have back pain, many people have leg pain, but almost always these things are self-limited. That means that it might last a week, it might last two weeks, it might even last a month, but then it usually goes away. And so pain that lasts more than that, that's really when it's appropriate to really start seeking further care. Things like a history of cancer, right? rapid weight loss, fever, chills, those are not normal. So those settings, my more systemic medical conditions in the setting of back pain might alert you that something more is going on. You know, another, another thing that's a little bit unusual, pain at rest, it's, it's unusual. Pain from the back is usually arthritic, right? Even if it's related to leg pain, it's usually arthritis. The arthritis progresses to the point that it pinches the nerves. And so most people have pain with motion. It's unusual to have pain at rest. Pain at rest can represent a problem. And then there are some strange things, you know, IV drug use, an ongoing infection, significant trauma. Th those are things that might alert a clinician to get, you know, that we need to take this more seriously. And probably the most important thing is the history, right? If you're, you know, a 65 year old woman and you fall and you, you know, either you hear a crack or you feel, and something just feels wrong. And now you have searing back pain. You know, there's a chance that there's a compression fracture there. Um, and that has to be taken seriously. It doesn't necessarily need surgery, but it does need management. And I wanted to show here two examples. These are terms that I'm sure people have heard and sound confusing. People break their back, but they don't need surgery. That sounds strange. Compression fractures, which are by far the most common fractures we see in practice, are stable. They're really annoying. You can vomit from the pain. It's so bad. And then over two, three, four, five, six weeks, the pain just goes away. I just wanted to point this out because... You know, my wife will have pain. She'll come. She'll tell me everybody thinks they have cancer. It's almost never cancer, right? It's really, really rare to have spinal cancer. And even when you have it, it's mostly, it's almost exclusively in people who have a known history of cancer elsewhere. And so this is metastatic disease. It's very, very, very rare. I can count on one hand the times I've seen a surgical reason why someone has a primary bone cancer in the spine. Having said all that, if you have a red flag sign and you're having lower back pain, up to 10%, which in medicine is very high, may represent that you have systemic disease, okay? Okay, I wanna move on to the next part of the talk. And the next part of the talk is, well, should we get imaging? You know, I, I see tons of patients in the office and my personal practice is that everyone who comes into my office gets a plain X-ray, right? They get an X-ray and they flex and extend. I'm gonna show two pictures of that in a moment. And the reason I do this is because, you know, we have to be, with ballooning healthcare costs, we have to be wardens of healthcare. And this is a cheap, easy test, super low risk. It's like taking a flight on, a, on an airplane. And so for such low risk, you can get useful information and it's easily can identify a fracture. I'm gonna show you what a flexion extension film looks like. Here you see, hopefully you guys can see my arrow. This is spinal motion, where instead of the bones all being lined up on one another, they actually shift on one another. That's called a spondylolisthesis. And that you can identify in flexion extension films. And then yes, like we've talked about, super rare, but you can pick up things like malignancy and infection. Okay, what about this one? So I think I need an MRI. Most patients, most of my patients at least, want an MRI when they come to my office. And it's not that I have a problem with that. I, I really don't. Again, it's super low risk test. The problem comes um, from the next slide. So if you look, this, this is a very famous study done in the spine literature. 
And if you look at people between 20 and 40, okay, so 40 and younger, over a third of them are going to have some sort of degeneration in MRI. That means they have a disc bulge, they have herniation, they have stenosis, they have something. By the time you get to 60, you're basically guaranteed to have something. So it's not that the MRI is not useful, but my job and a physician's job is to look at your symptoms and match them up with the radiographic findings and give you a treatment plan. If everyone is going to have a problem on an MRI, well, then that's not that useful unless we need to do something about it, right? Do we need to do an injection? Do we need to do surgery? Beyond that, we know you're going to have a problem on the MRI. So unless you have kind of failed the normal course of what I would do for you anyway, right? You're going to do the therapy, you're going to do the meds, we're going to give it some time. There's really not a whole lot of use in an MRI that early. Not to mention the fact that your insurance company is going to give you a hell of a time trying to get it approved, but not, not totally unfounded. The bottom line here is abnormal findings are really, really common. So, you know, sometimes patients will bring in their MRIs and they'll circle all these things. And I say, well, how are you feeling? And they say, fine. I said, then ignore it, right? Everyone's going to have something there. And you need to kind of consider that when you're making a treatment plan. The other thing is, okay, now let's say you see, or you have a disc herniation, right? There are different flavors of disc herniations. The disc herniation on the right, that arrow is pointing to a disc that is really quite severely compressing a nerve. The one, I'm sorry, on the left of the screen. On the right of the screen, that's also technically a herniation, but that person's not going to have any major problems. There's no pressure on a nerve. So there are flavors of these things as well. And most importantly, if you have an MRI report and it says you have a disc herniation or a slip disc or a protrusion or any number of things, that is not necessarily the reason why you're having back pain. That is not necessarily the reason you're having pain at all. Like we said, these things are super common and we need to kind of figure out what your, what your condition, um, how that's lining up with your image. Um, when it is important, obviously, is if you were to have what's called a radiculopathy, that's a fancy term for pain, numbness, tingling in a very specific distribution. The nice thing about extremity pain is it follows what's called a dermatome. That map on the right side of the screen, I could literally take a pencil and draw for you the majority of where your pain is based on an MRI if in fact you're having leg pain. It's that specific. And that's why you hear people saying, do you have leg pain? You know, and why leg pain gets so much better after surgery. We know exactly what we're treating with those things. Back pain is much more nebulous. And when you present with that radiculopathy, really what our job is, is it A, to figure out, is this even from your spine? I can't tell you probably three times a day, someone with bad hip arthritis comes into the office referred by you know, an outside practitioner saying this person's got all this sort of back pain. You examine their hips and it turns out they just have arthritis. And that happens more than you know. Okay, so let's talk about treatments. This is probably the most important slide of my entire talk, time. Most, most things are gonna get better with time. Back pain, leg pain, all sorts of things. If you look at the literature, if you look at my own patients, if you look at really all patients, 70% or greater of patients will get better over the first six weeks with a back or leg flare, really with doing nothing at all, maybe a little bit of Advil and some physical therapy. So that's probably the most important thing you need to know, right? Just be patient. Most of these things are self-limited. Okay, I wanted to slide this whole little section in. I said to my wife and kids, I said, hey guys, if you can hear anything from a back, I could tell you anything about it, what would you want to hear? And of course, my four-year-old, who's like a YouTube addict, is like, show me a video. Like she wants to see videos of surgery. I was like, I don't know that I really want to like scare all my patients. So I decided we're going to do a fact or fiction about very common kind of you know, old sayings and how many of this is evidence-based. Now that's not to say that, you know, if you sprinkle garlic on your head, it can't help. You know, I hear that all the time. Like, you know, you told me it wouldn't work, you know, if I, uh, you know, kick the can down the road and, you know, I did that and now I'm all better. This is just, we're, we're talking about level one data that this stuff has been proven to work. Okay. And let's go through a couple of these. So Advil or Aleve, NSAIDs can help my back. pain. I think most people know this, but fact. So randomized controlled trial, that means I take 50 people and I say half of you go with Advil, half of you get a sugar pill. At, at least at three months, taking non steroidal anti-inflammatories will have better control of your back pain than not. So when people say, you know, I tell people to take Advil, you know, people poo-poo it. There's high quality data that if you take that for a month or so, you actually will have improvement in your symptoms, at least in the acute period. What about oral steroids? I hear that all the time. Well, you know, it, it worked for X or Y or Z. 
Interestingly, oral steroids for back pain have not been found to be useful. And I don't talk about leg pain, I'm talking about pure back pain. So again, a randomized controlled trial. We took half the patients and we said, half of you are gonna get five days of prednisone. The other half are gonna get a sugar pill. At one week and then really even at four weeks, no difference. That's not to say it doesn't work, but there was no difference over a sugar pill. And there are some risks of taking high dose prednisone. So we don't do that classically for back pain. What about Bengay? Icy hot, Bengay, capsaicin. Hey, my doctor blew me off. He told me to put capsaicin on my, on my back. You know, can that help? Yes. So high quality randomized control trials. I mean, you randomize, they actually use like a plaster. They put this capsaicin on a plaster and kind of put it on people's back. And then they looked at them at seven days and then again at a month. And so using it for seven days out to seven days and then a month had improvements compared to a gel without this. So I actually do recommend this for my patients. I think it'd be quite helpful. Okay, this one I think is perhaps the most obvious for anyone who's ever been to a doctor for back pain. Physical therapy or back pain is better than home care and medical management alone. Fact, so many people say, oh, therapy never worked. Oh, don't send me to therapy, give me home care. There is so much data that therapy can help for these conditions that it's really, really prudent probably to give it at least a shot. What about heat? Heat, I hear, oh, should I do heat? Should I do ice? What should we do? Well, fact, a randomized controlled trial where we looked at patients, we, a third of the patients got heat, a third of the patients got cryo, and a third had nothing in it, right? So, but they did have a, a pad on them. And while heat and cold were both better than nothing, heat actually was superior to cold for axial dominant back pain. Anyway, I thought those were kind of interesting. What about acupuncture? Again, people poo-poo this to me all the time. Pretty reasonable data that 10 sessions, 30 minutes at a time versus sham, okay, just regular needling versus medication showed better pain control at a month for chronic lower back pain. All right, what about some other treatment options? I'm gonna briefly go through these. We talked about physical therapy. The goal of therapy is core strengthening and extremity strengthening. Sometimes you hear about nerve gliding. The goal is to kind of stretch out the nerve, make sure you're not getting scarring of the nerve, sensitize your nerve to the pain, your body gets used to it and it can overcome, even with the presence of an ongoing disc herniation. Sometimes you hear about injections, Injections come in two flavors classically. I don't do injections myself, but there are the interlaminar where that goes into the central. That's a more of a shotgun approach. It's usually a bit less painful also, although not necessarily as specific versus a transferaminal or a selective nerve root block where we're trying to say, hey, is this this woman's L4 nerve? And so you inject that nerve itself, usually a bit more painful because you're going right at the nerve, but much more specific. It really gives us good information as to what the problem is. And then lastly, surgery. Right, And so when all us else fails, sometimes people are surgical candidates. And that comes in two flavors. Generally, you can either have a decompression where we take the pressure off a nerve. That's a huge disc herniation. That's once that disc is removed. Or fusion. And fusion comes in numerous flavors. Sometimes you have big surgeries for scoliosis. Sometimes they're quite small. The picture on the right, that was a patient of mine maybe two weeks ago. I, I took a picture in anticipation of the talk. These are minimally invasive approaches. At this point, you're talking about one, one and a half inch incisions. Um, so it's certainly not what it was. And again, just to, to recap, you're a surgical candidate when you've had six to eight time, right? You've had to have failed time. We don't need to jump into surgery if you don't need it. Or things like progressive weakness, disabling pain. Okay, so in summary, low back pain is really, really common. It's the second most common reason that people end up seeing doctors. Unfortunately, most people don't take the time to give you a specific diagnosis. Thankfully, even without a specific diagnosis, most people will get better with time alone. It can be occasionally problematic. And those red flags that we talked about, pay attention to those. That can mean a problem. You know, if you failed four to six weeks, that can be a problem. And of course, leg pain can be a problem. Yet lastly, anatomic abnormalities on imaging studies. That means finding a disc herniation, finding stenosis. That's super common. Even in asymptomatic people, it's super common. So don't stress about that stuff. Just make sure you're correlating your physical exam, your complaints to what you're seeing on MRI. And that's really it. So I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. Um, I don't know if they're in the chat or if people want to kind of just jump in. I'm not sure the most organized way to do this, but I, I'll really answer anything. Okay, the first presentation I see is so what do we think about CBD oil for back pain? Could it be helpful? 
I'm going to talk to you about the evidence. I'm going to talk to you about anecdotally. What I mean by anecdotally is I see, you know, let's say I'm seeing 40 patients in a day, three days a week, right? So that's a lot of data points. And I will tell you, I want to say, I really want to say that everyone does great with the CBD oil. I would tell you it's probably closer to 50-50. I have some patients who say it's a panacea, right? They had terrible, terrible pain. They're just not good surgical candidates. They're not even great injection candidates because they have back dominant symptoms and they really feel great after the CBD oils. Some are not. Now, the other thing I've noticed is there seem to be different formulations. People seem to like the creams more than the cells. I guess there's like an oil versus a cream. The creams seem a little bit better. Um, now, in terms of the data, the data is all over the place. And the, the problem is a lot of this stuff is only recently becoming more both socially acceptable and medical legally acceptable. So they are coming out and over the next year or two, we will start seeing randomized controlled trials looking at these things. But right now, at least as a scientist, right, we're looking at high quality data. We're saying if we're randomized, we're giving somebody CBD oil and we're giving somebody nothing, right? We're, we're like an oil with nothing in it. And how do they do? Right. And they, well, then you need to match them. You need to make sure there's similar types of patients. And then you look at that and you say, well, how'd they do? We don't have that data yet, unfortunately, but I'll tell you, there's, there's really little harm in using it. Um, and there's all upside in my opinion. So I, I would say, give it a shot. All right. The next question I see here is vitamin D helpful for bone strengthening. Absolutely. Um, so for people with osteoporosis, osteoporosis is defined as either having a fragility fracture that means you broke your hip, you broke your back, you broke your wrist, you broke your shoulder in a low trauma mechanism, right? You weren't in a car accident, you just fell and broke it. That is the definition of osteoporosis or after a DEXA scan, having minus two and a half, that's your T score minus two, I'm sorry, Z score minus two and a half. That means matching people of your own age or younger um, two and a half standard deviation. So assume you have the, def the definition of osteoporosis, you absolutely should be on vitamin D and calcium. Um, vitamin D has also been shown potentially to help improve um, bone healing after surgery. Um, and it can help modulate, um, modulate pain really um, in even regular people. And most people are vitamin D deficient. So um, I would definitely recommend using vitamin D. The next question I see is, can severe leg spasm be related to a back issue? I mean, the short answer to that is um, possibly. Um, leg pain, like we said, the hallmark of nerve pressure is leg pain. In fact, so much so that I classically tell people, let's jump like surgery, right? Surgery is designed to treat leg pain, not really back pain, even though it's usually coming from the back. But there can be a lot of reasons to have spasm. You can have... Um, abnormalities in your electrolytes, that'll cause spasm. You can have, quote, restless leg syndrome. That's not necessarily related to your back. That can cause spasm. You can have spasm from dehydration. Um, you can have spasm from uh, peripheral neuropathy, right? Not necessarily related to the back, but the nerves of the legs themselves. So it's a yes and no. It's possible, but not, not necessary. Okay, the next thing I see is, what is the typical treatment for spinal stenosis? Um, so that's a good question. Um, and spinal stenosis classically is treated like other, like other conditions in the back. And kind of going back to what we talked about earlier, spinal stenosis means there's pressure. People always say, what does stenosis mean? You could have a stenotic pipe. Stenosis just means narrowing. So it's narrowing of the spine, giving you symptoms. The hallmark of those symptoms are back and leg pain, worsened with walking that's relieved by sitting down or leaning forward. And so the typical treatment for that is much like other conditions, you start conservatively and you progress. But the conservative treatment is frequently effective. Um, and it's things like physical therapy and consideration for epidural injections and anti-inflammatory medication. I would say that that is usually temporarily successful. Spinal stenosis, the challenge is eventually people get to a point where that stenosis doesn't go away on its own. And so you're at a you know, you're kind of at a fork where do I want this managed surgically or not? We have very high quality data that people who have surgery for spinal stenosis do in fact do better than those that do not out to eight years. So it's a durable procedure. I mean, there's lots of ways to do the procedure, but classically, um, one of the most famous trials um, in medical literature is called the sports study. 
And that's the one that people quote that says that people who have spinal stenosis ultimately do better than those that don't, assuming you failed a course of non-operative management. Okay. My back makes a cracking noise. What does that mean? So that's a good question. It's a question we hear a lot. The answer is I don't have a great answer for you. So there are a lot of reasons to have cracking. Most of the time it's called crepitus. So you have kind of grinding of not smooth articular surfaces. So people will hear that sometimes in their knees or their ankles, and you can hear some cracking because of those joint surfaces rubbing on one another. Sometimes it's kind of like popping, like you can pop your joints and people talk about nitrogen bubbles kind of coming out of the joints as they kind of move. Possibly sometimes if, you, I mean, if you have instability, like I referred to before that spondylolisthesis, people have cracking. I tell people all the time, the cracking is not a problem to me. It's a problem if it's painful. Um, that's when it should be explored. Beyond that, if it's just making noise, it might be a little bit embarrassing, but it, it's really probably not that big a deal. Okay, when do you consider surgery? Okay, that, that's a tough question. It of course depends uh, what the surgical indication is, um, but let's just talk broadly. Um, yes, you should have failed a course of physical therapy. Injections are dealer's choice. Um, I have some patients who are really adamant about injections and lots of injections, and I support their decision to do that. I think, you know, if people are kind of engaged in their own care, I think people generally do better. And then some people don't want that temporary relief and they want to go to surgery. I, I think the most important thing, like I said, is time. I Meaning, is this going to be a condition that if you just give it a few months, it's going to get better? Or is this really intractable pain that, you know, to the best of your ability, you're trying to do everything, you're trying to stay active and it's really interfering with your life. I think that's probably when you're a good candidate. And then of course it matters. Is this a back dominant issue? Is this a neck issue? Is it an arm issue? Have, do you have an appropriate diagnosis? How severe are the findings? And that's all kind of patient specific. Okay. When the weather gets ready to act up, I get extreme hip pain. I think this means, but I have arthritis and MS in addition to the back pain. So where do I start as far as where to find out what it is and staying, instead of saying it's the weather? Okay, so I have a funny story. So when I was a resident at NYU, this is probably almost 12 years ago now, um, one of my junior residents did a study. And he, what he did was he literally performed a study half during the spring and then again in the, in the winter. And he randomly was just asking patients in our clinics what their pain level was. These were patients who were having hip and knee arthritis. And he actually showed that even if you controlled for other factors, other factors, socioeconomic factors, uh, you know, education factors, all these other things, if you controlled for all of that, during cold weather, people still had more pain. There definitely is something about the weather that affects it. I don't know if it's barometric pressure. I don't know if it's the cold. I'm not sure if it makes people stiff versus being loose, but there's definitely something to the weather. So not to discount the other symptoms, but I would agree that people in, in bad weather are definitely have more pain than in good weather. Okay, there are a few yoga exercises that are helpful for back pain. For example, cat, cow, arching the spine. Definitely, there is another good level one study showing that yoga can be an effective treatment modality for back pain. So I will echo the sentiment, it says here of Liz Murphy, that yoga can be excellent to help with back pain. Okay, thoughts on chiropractic care and inversion device. So um, the NEST, which is the North American Spine Society, which is like our big kind of spine society, it's physiatry, spine surgeons, primary care, chiro, it, it's kind of everyone. They did a clinical guidelines. I think you guys can probably all look it up. I'm not sure whether you'd have access to it or not, but if you go to NASS and you Google NASS clinical guidelines for lower back pain, you'll see really, it, it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe a 200 page document going through all the high quality data points about management of back pain. And so I'm not going to refer to chiropractic here because spinal manipulative therapy can be helpful. Kind of depends what you mean by chiropractics. I think, um, uh, you know, manipulation can be helpful. I don't have any major problems with it. Um, uh, some of my post-operative patients, I don't love it for, but certainly pre-op should be okay. But inversion, kind of traction. I used to think before I did reading that that was helpful because traction for neck and arm issues is. For chronic lower back pain, there's inconclusive data whether it helps or not. So my dad's having an issue now. He bought himself an inversion table. He kind of goes over, he does it every day, but I'm not sure it's actually doing anything. Do I recommend spinal decompression to help alleviate back pain? So unfortunately or fortunately, you really need to tread carefully doing decompressions for back dominant symptoms. Now, there are cases 
where the stenosis can be so severe that it really does cause back dominant symptoms. And I have a handful of patients that I've done that for, but it's really the exception rather than the rule. Classically, spine surgery is designed to treat leg pain, which is why one of the hallmarks of our talk today was leg pain, right? If you're, the absence of leg pain should be reassuring to give this time and let this see whether this cools off itself. Now, I suspect the reason you're asking this question is because your back pain is intractable and you've tried probably a lot and it's not working. I hate to say it, that doesn't always mean the next step is surgery. I, I don't know the specifics, but classically, that's what I say. Um, does Tylenol help? So Tylenol or acetaminophen, there's no high quality data that it helps. Having said that, I frequently use Tylenol in my armamentarium, especially for older patients who I don't really wanna you know, put them at increased for, for GI things or bleeding or those types of issues, which are certainly side effects of NSAIDs. And they're not really candidates for things like tramadol or any sort of narcotics, which will just knock them out. I really do use Tylenol. I use it at a thousand milligrams, three times a day. You don't wanna go more than four grams. And I think to give yourself a safety barrier, I say three grams. So in, in truth, Tylenol, the data is not there, but clinically in my practice, I use it. Um, I have arthritis and I'm not even 50 years old. How long can I take Advil and is it safe? So both excellent questions. So generally Advil is safe. However, there are side effects. It can affect your kidney function. So if you have hypertension or kidney function, you need to kind of tread carefully and it can affect your GI system. Even the selective cell, um, cell, uh, COX inhibitors, like things like Celebrex and Meloxicam, they're much gentler on your stomach, but they're not perfect. And if you start having your stomach being upset, you got to stop it also. I generally try to give people holidays, meaning if you're taking Advil for a month, give yourself a break. It's, it's probably too much. And just make sure you're talking to your primary care doctor about it. And so the next question was some NSAIDs affect blood pressure meds. Is it safe to take both? It's not that they really affect the blood. They affect the kidneys and they affect the kidneys ability to both filter your blood and kind of reabsorb water. Um, and so you can overwhelm your kidneys ability to function. And so I think that's what you mean by affecting your blood pressure medication. They are safe to take both. You just need to, you need to be a little bit careful with that. So I made it through all the questions in the chat. Oh, we got a couple more. And then if people want to just chime in, I'm happy to answer questions like that too. Okay. If you have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, post back surgery and still in pain, can you explain why the surgeon now wants to put a screw in the sacrum? Okay, so Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, for those who don't know, is a collagen disorder where people have ligamentous laxity. That means their joints are hypermobile and move more than average. And it's possible that if you had spine surgery and the nerve problems were addressed, when you even had a fusion, and now the surgeon thinks that you're having sacroiliac instability or ligamentous laxity in the sacrum, which is common, it's possible that he is now recommending a fusion. Now, for sacroiliac issues, you should have had, well, I shouldn't say you should have. In my practice, you would have had physical therapy followed by at least two injections, giving you 70% or greater improvement in your symptoms for some period of time. If you have both of those, then yes, you would be a surgical candidate to fuse the SI joint, which is, I suspect, what you have. It is not unreasonable, and it's certainly not unreasonable in some with Ehlers-Danlos, um, and I suspect that's what's going on, but it, it's hard to say definitively. Okay, my lower back or butt leg pain is intermittent, but often flares up with a day that has a lot of sitting. Why would that be? And even while doing PT, it can flare up. So that's a great question. So there are certain parts of the spine, such as L4-5 and L5-S1, where the nerves make up the sciatic nerve. Now, so your sciatic nerve, as we discussed, goes down the back of the leg. Well, think of a nerve as a piece of string. And when we pull the string tight, it causes pain because the nerve is taut. And when we loosen the string, it gets laxer. And so it will improve your pain. Well, imagine a string on your butt, right? And it goes from your butt to your foot. Well, when you're standing, you know, point A to B is kind of stretched out. But imagine how much more it's even stretched out if you're sitting and then you straighten your leg. So the point of maximum stretch for the sciatic nerve is sitting with your legs straight out. And if that's happening, that really can be why you're having that pain. That's, that's really the hallmark of sciatica. That can be a problem. Um, other, the other reason you can have that is, you know, if you're a relatively thin person, your sciatic nerve is kind of right under your butt. So if you're irritating it by sitting on it all day, uh, that can also cause irritation. 
does the massage guns that are trending now, are they good to use? So I don't know, but I have one myself. It's called a Theragun. Um, I feel better with it. I don't think it's curing anything, but certainly I think when your muscles are tight, um, I use it myself, especially if I'm working out or something. I like them. I don't think I'm, you know, I don't have thankfully any sort of nerve issue. Um, and I think if it's hurting you, I wouldn't do it, but I don't have any problem with people using it. Um, I don't get paid. I have no disclosures um, from the Theragun, but I like it. Um, I've used pain management for many injections. And recently I've had two milds and a vertiflex. So for people who don't know mild or vertiflex, those are minimally invasive procedures that are done by physiatrists. They're not necessarily done by spine surgeons. Um, they are FDA approved um, and they have limitations. Um, and I think, um, I don't wanna put my foot in my mouth here. You have to be careful having non-surgeons do quasi-surgical procedures because if, in, if those procedures go badly, um, do they have the toolbox to fix those problems? And do they have the toolbox to fix them then? And do they even have a referral pattern to send them out? Having said that, people, you know, people do well with some of these procedures. Um, what they do, what a Vertiflex is, is you're basically inserting a small device to kind of gently open up the space for the nerves, um, not directly, but indirectly. And those can be helpful. Um, having said that, I've had to uh, revise a few of them. So that, that's maybe a little bit too specific for this talk. Um, I drive a lot. It seems to be causing trouble for my back. Me too. So I come from Philadelphia up to, uh, you know, our region, Capital Health every day and um, driving. So there are, there are two occupations that have been shown to increase and worsen back pain, jackhammering, no shocker there and truck driving, long driving. Um, so, you know, I, there's no real option, right? You got to drive, but, you know, maybe taking frequent breaks, um, using a lumbar support, those things can be helpful, but driving stinks. I'm right there with you. What do you recommend for those with piriformis syndrome? So classically, you know, stretching is the treatment for piriformis syndrome. Um, my dad is literally going through the same thing right now and he doesn't have a huge disc herniation. So we're trying to work him up and we've done SI. And so I just sent him to somebody to do a piriformis injection where under ultrasound, they gave the injection directly into the piriformis nerve. Obviously that was not his problem. It didn't help, but that is an option. Um, classically though, it's piriformis stretching, which is flexion and deep bending into that hip to stretch out that piriformis. You know, there are people who will do piriformis releases. You know, I think you need to tread carefully with surgery for that, but there, there are surgical procedures as well. Is acupuncture effective for less severe problems? Yes. You know, in the talk, what I was showing was acupuncture is one of the modalities which has level one data, meaning high quality evidence that shows for chronic lower back pain, it can be an improvement in your symptoms above and beyond what you would get with medical management otherwise. Now there may be a wall, right? There's all, all things you know, eventually may kind of fizzle out and you may look at something like, you know, surgery or something like that. But I have absolutely no problem with acupuncture and acupuncture of all things actually has some good, good data. Is it better to work at a standing desk than sitting to alleviate or prevent back and leg issues? Um, it really kind of depends. Uh, it depends what the condition is. Um, I think if you feel better doing it, then certainly you should do it. Um, I, unfortunately, I don't think it really can prevent back or leg issues. I think most of the stuff we've talked about today, most of the stuff that I see is unfortunately largely genetic. There's of course, environmental factors also. Um, but there's, you know, I, I think unfortunately, if you're going to get back pain, you might, you might end up getting it regardless, but if it helps you, then I think you should do it. Is acupuncture okay for sciatica? So that's kind of what I'm, I kind of answered that one already. Would stem cell injection help for lumbar spinal stenosis? So that's a great question. So <coughs> There is an emerging body of evidence talking about stem cells for discogenic problems. Spinal stenosis is different, right? If you have narrowing of the canal from facet hypertrophy, bony overgrowth, no, of course, stem cells can't help with that. But if you have it from a disc bulge, probably you should not be considering surgery if it's so mild. Stem cell injections may help. I say may help because if you look at the data, meaning so there's there's the world of you go to somebody and they tell you, hey, you should do a stem cell injection, pay $10,000 to make this better. And then there's the world of data. The truth probably lies somewhere between. So if the, the right now, there's no high quality data that it will work. But anecdotally, that means when you talk to people, people are very happy with these things. So I think if you got some money to burn, um, I think there's very little downside. I mean, there is always the potential risk of an infection, but beyond that, which I think is low, um, I don't have a problem with those things, but I think you can't go in with the expectation that this is definitely going to help. I think you need to be a little bit, um, you know, just a little bit skeptical. I have an age 81 female with a history of two laminectomies with titanium plates. I 
maybe rods and screws for stabilization. PT now with right leg pain, surgery inescapable. You know, it really matters, I think, what your radiographic imaging looks like. Is this a chronically painful nerve? Is this, you know, still there's some stenosis there even with the surgery? Is this adjacent segment? You know, do you have a new issue? Um, so that's kind of a, a very specific question. Um, I'd be happy to answer, but I don't really have the full, the full picture. Um, wait another couple minutes, see if anything pops up in here. Guys, those were great questions. Um, I hope the talk was helpful for everyone. Um, I really appreciate you all inviting me here to talk. Um, I left up my contact info. Um, Leslie Harkins is also on the call today. She's an amazing resource. Um, Capital is really great and they're really great with help facilitating um, people getting to the right providers. So um, thank you all. And if there's nothing else, um, I'm gonna wish you all a good night.